All right, we've reached the critical mass. So good afternoon from Brussels, everybody. My name is Roger Kefferputz. I'm the director of the EU office of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, the German Green Political Foundation affiliated with the German Green Party. And I would like to welcome you all to this webinar where we will analyze the results of the European Parliament elections and their implications for the future of Europe. And I'm very excited to have so many experts from all over Europe joining us today, as well as from participants from all over the world. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. But before we start, let me just share with you a little bit more information and some housekeeping rules to ensure we have a smooth event and a smooth sailing. First, this Zoom webinar is also being live streamed on YouTube. So you can also watch the recording after the event and come back to any particular points that you thought were particularly interesting. And second, at any moment, if you have any questions or comments, use the Q&A box. You'll find that box at the bottom of your Zoom window. Please be respectful and constructive and also state your name and affiliation. Okay, so we have a really charged program. We have three different segments, one looking particularly at the analysis of the European Parliament elections. What was the outcome? What was the result? What coalitions are there? Who are the winners, the losers? A second segment with country spotlights where we delve deeper in some of the national EU member states. And then a third segment where we'll discuss in a panel, what does this actually mean for Europe the future of Europe and some of the big issues that Europe is facing, such as the reform and enlargement, but also the future of the European Green Deal. So a charged, busy program. And without much further ado, let me give the floor straight away to the president of our foundation and former member of the European Parliament. So he knows all about Europe and the European Parliament elections. Jan Philipp Albrecht, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Roderick. And also from my side, a warm welcome to everyone here in this webinar, uh, which we received over 300 registrations. And I al also can see that almost as many people are in now to watch this analysis. And I think that shows we are, satis we are satisfying an analytical need here right after the European elections. And obviously, we are all sitting uh, uh, in the rooms to analyze the numbers of these uh, elections, uh, which put um, a lot of questions on the table. And we want to talk about that from uh, very different perspectives. And I'm very happy that uh, Roderick, uh, you and all the others in our Europe team have organized uh, this webinar. My name is Jan Philipp Albrecht, as Roder Roderick just said. I'm one of the two co-presidents of the Heinrich Böll Foundation on a global level. And I'd like to uh, best use of my five minutes to kick off this webinar by painting a bigger picture of this uh, year's EU elections. So obviously one important uh, result is there is still a pro-democratic majority in the European Parliament after this election also a pro-European uh, majority, but obviously it has shrunk consider considerably. And also we can see that this means there is a more fragile majority. Uh, there is a need for uh, obviously uh, stronger coherence and maybe even uh, a broader alliance in the European Parliament to also carry a new European Commission. In general, we also see that this comes with a shift to the right in the parliament with particular consequences uh, with regard to the election results for the two strong uh, member states uh, always playing some kind of the role of the motor, Germany and France. If you look at the maps, uh, of course, uh, you see the shift to right wing extremists uh, in, a, in a broad way and already see the effects like the new legislative elections coming up in France and obviously the run up to the legislative elections in Germany next year already rising at the horizon. So uh, this is something to look at the impact of the youth vote and how come that they not vote for the 
Greens or also other democratic parties uh, uh, of uh, the uh, um, uh, of the already existing groups, but for smaller parties, for also for more conservatives, more far far right, these are questions to look at. And also, what does it mean for the future of the Green Deal? Also, for the Greens in that context, of course, uh, is something we want to talk about. The EPP, obviously, as the strongest. Uh, a uh, winner of this election will now speak with the Social Democrats, the Liberals, the Greens to agree on loose cooperation, which could also secure the majority for Ursula von der Leyen as uh, president of the European Commission in the second term. But obviously, they also uh, look theoretically uh, towards possible cooperation with right-wing uh, parties, right extremist parties also. Uh, they didn't rule out cooperation with uh, Giorgia Meloni's Fratelli d'Italia. And uh, this also, of course, will determine whether the European Parliament will continue to balance out right-wing or nationalistic tendencies from the European Council, uh, or at least certain members of the European Council, and form a counterweight as it has uh, done in the past. So what follows from that, um, it's obvious that there needs to be more coherence between the pro-democratic and pro-European forces in the European Parliament, more important than ever. There needs to be strong efforts in order to push back right-wing extremist parties, especially in Germany and France in the upcoming time, especially when we, co uh, when we look at the rural areas, also Eastern Germany. And uh, the Greens, they have lost considerably above all in their strongholds where, or where they are currently in government. And that shows that there is a lack of mobilization among their own political uh, voter potential. And uh, that uh, seems to be an important question for the Greens, how to deal with that. And last but not least, um, uh, let me say once again, thank you uh, to the Brussels office to organize this. We want to look forward to, or we are looking forward now to the inputs and the analysis from different uh, people we invited. So I'm handing back to you, Roderick. Thank you for organizing this. Thank you very much, Jan, for these introductory words and also giving us some food for thought, which I'm sure we'll be discussing later in the panel. So. Without much further ado, let's kick off with our first segment, where it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Simon Hicks, the Stein Rockham Chair in Comparative Politics at the European Union University Institute in Florence. Simon is one of the most renowned scholars on European studies and was for many years a professor at the London School of Economics. And due to his expertise on public opinion and voting behavior, electoral systems and legislative behavior, he has really provided lots of electoral forecasts and analysis about the European elections since decades. And I, for one, I bet many other people are avid followers of Simon on social media. So we really look forward to his analysis, your analysis, Simon. It's great to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Simon, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, what I'm, I'm going to, I've got a short presentation with my sort of first take of uh, what I think uh, the European Parliament elections tell us, uh, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to be the bearer of bad news for the Green uh, family. Um, so here we go. So the, uh, uh, the first thing I'd say is when we look at turnout, uh, turnout has been largely flat. Uh, this is a, perhaps a bit disappointing, meaning. If the uh, Eurobarometer opinion polls were suggesting that there was going to be a jump in turnout, the election seemed quite uh, mobilized. But if we go back to 2019, it was largely younger, green environmental voters in some of the larger member states mobilized by the Fridays for Future. That didn't really happen this time round. It also didn't help that the elections were in June rather than May. So this is a story of, of election, the turnout being largely flat, depending on how you measure it. There's lots of different ways of thinking about turnout, whether it's EU-wide turnout or average turnout across the member states, or average turnout amongst the eight countries that have had elections through all waves, so there's no compositional change over time. But however you think of it, turnout has largely been flat. When we look at the actual makeup of the chamber, so this is the results um, as of they are today, uh, this morning, with uh, and I've taken the Europe Alex 
uh, project uh, projections based on the information they have about where everybody is going to sit. Um, by the way, I think they do a fabulous job in giving us and analyzing uh, the results of all Euro elections across Europe, including the European Parliament elections. You can see a big shift to the right. So you can see how the middle of the parliament there has moved rightwards. And you can see how there's an increase, particularly in, in groups to the right of the EPP and a large group of non-attached. And I'll come back to those in a second. One big question is, will we see new groups or new alignments emerging? Uh, remember, it, it, it takes 23 MEPs from a quarter of member states, so that 23 MEPs from seven countries to be able to form a group. Could we see a realignment on the right with a lot of those MEPs who currently are in the non-attached or not yet attached? We might think of them. So with AFD in particular there, Fides, uh, the Romanian party, Volia from Bulgaria, South, a brand new party from Spain with three MEPs. Um, you can see a lot of the, the MEPs on the right. I think there's probably 49 of the non-attached MEPs I'd put as right or radical right. So there's potential for a lot over there to join either ID or ECR. And we could see some shuff shuffling around of who sits in ID and who sits in ECR. Um, I can imagine, for example, that Le Pen, uh, particularly if she does well in the French elections, might demand that uh, she wants to sit in ECR. She's now a party of government. She's like Maloney. Why can't she also sit in ECR? And I think that could be real, really tempting for ECR to add another 30 MEPs. Over on the left, there's a possibility of a new left nationalist group, or if you like, a uh, uh, conservative left group, or uh, an anti-European left group, or a pro-Putin left group, however you want to call it. There's been some discussion about that's the, the BSW uh, from Germany, uh, Sarah Wagner, but there's also some mention of a five star in Italy. In Italy here, interestingly, where I'm sitting right now, there doesn't seem to be that sort of speculation. Uh, there's more a discussion of whether they join the left group or the Greens. So these potentially I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about whether or not uh, those eight MEPs from five star could potentially join the Greens. But there are quite a lot of other MEPs in the non-attached group or even in the current left group who are left authoritarians or left nationalists, if you like. So I think there, there could potentially be a brand new group on the left in the European Parliament. When we think about how, how to consider the broader significance or the historical significance of these elections, this is a, a composition of the parliament over time. And you can see there the 50% line and you can see how when we think that most of those non-attached MEPs over there are actually on the radical right, so around 50 of them, uh, you can see how this is the most right-wing parliament we've ever had uh, in the EU. We saw the left had a majority back in 1989, and now the right clearly have a majority. This has big policy and political implications, as I'm going to come to, and it means that the EPP will be sitting in the middle of the parliament as the pivotal party, looking to decide whether they form coalitions to their right or whether they form coalitions to their left. And in a sense, there's no non-EPP potential majority uh, which is, has not been the situation in the current parliament. When we look at the coalition sizes in the current parliament, you can see how the grand coalition of the two big parties already was well below 50%. The super grand coalition or the von der Leyen coalition, if you like, of the three centrist parties there, you can see is down, still above 50%. But if you look down there, the other interesting thing is the EPP have an alternative majority for the first time. They have a majority that potentially does not include Renew and does not include S&D if they lean rightwards. It's not that they would form a coalition deal with their parties to their right. But what we've seen a lot of votes in the parliament is when the EPP breaks away from that grand coalition and the other MEPs on the right vote with them, they actually were close to winning a majority in the current parliament and they would more likely clearly win a majority in the new parliament. Because What's been interesting and why I think this is such a significant shift is if you look at all the votes in the outgoing parliament, so this is like 17,000 votes, this little graph shows the percentage of time the majorities in each of the groups voted the same way. You can see how the darker colors there on the left show how the parliament was slightly sort of left leaning. So, you know, EPP voting 87% of the time with the socialists, EPP uh, voting 80% with RE and EPP even voting 60% of the time with the Greens. And so you can see how this was a slightly left leaning parliament, EPP only voting 62% of the time with ECR. So you can see how if we look particularly at environment issues, so over 2000 votes on environment issues, you can see how it was a clear left wing majority in the parliament. And in fact, what's interesting is how if you follow the track of all the votes on environment over time, there was a very pro large block, pro European Green Deal at the beginning of the parliament in 2019. 
And that gradually eroded rightwards over the course of the parliament, where the EPP started to vote against the Green Deal. And by the end of the parliament, some of the packages of the Green Deal were only passed by very narrow majorities of, say, 10 or 12 votes, with the bulk of the EPP voting against them. And now, if the EPP decide they're not going to support a sort of ambitious climate change agenda for the EU, they can form a majority that is in favor of rolling back on that agenda. And I think this is going to be a big challenge. And von der Leyen has already signaled that she wants to head in that direction and leaning to the rightwards with, for the support of Maloney and the CDU in Germany leaning to the rightwards. The CDU in Germany much more upset with her towards the end of the parliament saying that she was against the interests of farmers, against the interests of the car industry. And I think we may see a very different commission and a very different set of promises from her if she's going to get elected. Does so that lead me to talk about what, you know, could she get elected? I think she will get elected. I think it's going to be very difficult, a much more complex jigsaw puzzle than last time round. She could rely on this centrist big bloc coalition. We remembered in 2019, the Greens initially did not support her for commission president, but they supported the commission as a whole. So in a sense, the Greens entered that coalition and gradually over time, the EPP left that coalition. And we were left with a bloc supporting the commission, which was the socialists, the liberals and the Greens, that just and, and some of the MEPs on the far left. And that had a bloc in favor of a lot of the ambitious environment legislation. On migration, it was a very different coalition that involved a more right-leaning coalition with the socialists voting more with the right on, on some of those issues. With the same level of cohesion as we had back in 2019 in the vote to elect the commission, which, by the way, is by secret ballot, and she needs an absolute majority of votes, so she's going to need um, 361 votes to back her. Uh, you can see that last time around, she only got you know just above the majority needed, uh, eight votes more than she needed back then with a larger, slightly larger parliament when the UK was in. But that same level of cohesion, I think she wouldn't get through the parliament. She's going to need to build coalitions the problem is she, it's a delicate balancing act. If she leans rightwards to get Maloney and parties of the ECR on board, she loses support on the left. I think the socialists are going to be very interesting to watch. There aren't many socialists in government. They're currently just in government in Germany, Spain, Denmark, and Malta as the heads of government. I think the German government, of course, is going to have a CDU commissioner if she gets elected. Uh, Spain, Denmark, Malta, the parties the, the MEPs that represent these parties are only the parties in government. A lot of the other MEPs in the socialist group are going to be thinking, why should we support this coalition? In Italy, for example, the PD did relatively well in these elections. They're going to be the second largest delegation in the socialist group. And they're going to be saying, why should we support Maloney, a Maloney type government at the European level? I think this is going to be a very difficult coalition for her to build. So to sum up, a big right wing shift a big swing to the right, the median MEP, the middle MEP, the pivotal MEP is going to be in the EPP, not in Renew or the Liberals for the first time. We're going to see a large block of MEPs to the right of the EPP that may be realigned in some different way. And for the first time, a populist right majority. Remember, at the national level, a lot of the parties in the centre right are in government or with support of populist right parties. If we think what's just happened in the, in the Netherlands, we think what's going to come up. In Austria, we think what has already happened throughout Scandinavia and where it's likely to be heading in Spain with the Pepe potentially forming a, the next government with Fox. You can already see a lot of the parties inside the EPP leaning rightwards and willing to form a government with parties to their right. And I think we're going to see the same thing going on at the European level. It's, we're going to see the most right wing parliament, the most right wing commission and the most right wing council that we've probably ever seen in the EU. And that could have major policy implications and particularly on environment issues, which I think I think it's going to be a fight to maintain the ambitious Green Deal agenda that we've seen up to now. Thank you so much, Simon. If I can follow up maybe directly with one question. You mentioned most right parliament ever with the EPP in the middle. What does that mean? for the EPP, because in the EPP, you also, it's a kind of a big tent group, right? You have progressive forces there. You have some who are maybe a bit more to the right. Do you think there could be less cohesion in the EPP? How do you see the EPP moving forward? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. I think a lot of the politics in the parliament will be inside the EPP now. And I think there's going to be an, uh, an argument going on inside the EPP. Uh, you're right, there's a more moderate, more pro-environment wing of the EPP. For example, if we look at the votes on environment issues in the parliament, 
the Fine Gael in Ireland, some of the Scandinavian parties were voting more with the left, even when the rest of the EPP was, was voting against the ambitious climate change agenda. And I think there are parties, um, but even, even there in Scandinavia and even in the Benelux, where we used to think of the parties in EPP and the Benelux being more centrist, they are forming governments with populist right parties. We see that in the Netherlands now, where where NSC, BBB, uh, you know, the, the parties from the Netherlands that are in the EPP are going to be forming a government with Wilders. So, I mean, I, I, and we see in Italy, Forza Italia, in government with Maloney. And so, you know, you go around Europe and increasingly there's a, lot, a growing proportion of parties inside the EPP that are leaning rightwards. And we could see the same in Austria with the OVP forming a government with the FPO in Austria after the next Austrian election. So, uh, you know, there may be a lot of action going on inside the EVP, but I think the instinct of the EVP is to lean rightwards. The CDU are going to be the party to watch. The CDU are currently saying there's a coral sanitaire that says we don't do business with any parties to the right of the ECR. Uh, but I think that's going to be very difficult to maintain once Wildersing is in government in the Netherlands, the FPO are in government in Austria, perhaps the Rassemblement National are in government in France. I think that's going to be very difficult because at the same time, the CDU says we should be able to do business with any party that is in government. And so those two things come in conflict with each other when you get more radical right parties starting to be in government in quite a lot of member states. And like you mentioned, a lot will depend also on the Social Democrats and also the Liberals renew to what extent uh, yeah, they I mean, operate with an EPP moving maybe in a different direction. Right? Yeah, and, and of course, there is an argument going on inside Renew about what to do with Vivide, who are forming a government with Wilders. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the liberals are, in a sense, more pluralist in some ways than the EPP are, with a more social liberal wing and a more kind of free market economic wing, and even some parties in the liberals who are quite uh, uh, anti-immigration now. Um, so... The socialists, I think, my expectation is that there will be a coalition that comes together at the beginning of the parliament to back von der Leyen and to back the commission, which involves most of the socialists, perhaps even some Greens, say the German Greens who are in government in Germany. Um, but gradually that coalition will erode over time. And rather than, if we think back to 2019, the coalition that came together eroded rightwards, and, and left, you know, the EPP gradually leaving that coalition. I expect this time around the coalition will erode leftwards and it'll be gradually the left pulling away and deciding they're not really backing this more rightward leaning government at the European level. We do have one question from the Q&A and I think it's quite interesting, but I don't know whether you have those stats, Simon. So I'm just going to throw it out there. There was one question wondering to what extent there has been a gender dimension in the voting. You know, is there anything on women voting differently to men? Yeah, I mean, we've seen there's been quite a lot of studies of national elections. Um, and, and, you know, I think there's been quite a change over the last five, six, seven years in the type of voters that appeal that the populist right parties are appealing to. So seven or eight years ago, we used to say that it was quite easy to predict that the voters voting for the populist right were older, uh, lower skilled, lower educated men in rural areas. And that was the bulk of their support. That it's much more pluralist now. We've got larger groups of younger voters voting for the populist right, often lower educated younger voters, and we've got women voting for the populist right as well, particularly women in rural areas and women um, from more sort of socially conservative type of background. So it's a far more pluralist coalition that they've built. The parties themselves have changed. They're, they're, they've moderated themselves on some issues. They've become sort of more mainstream, if you like, on economic issues. They're even less anti-European than they were. And this is partly because I think they see that actually they could get control of the levers of government at the mm -hmm. European level and use them to deliver the policies they want, deliver a less ambitious environment policy, deliver a more a tougher migration policy with protecting the external borders of Europe, deliver a more free market liberalization of the single market and more flexibility in the single market. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see what type of promises, or what type of work program the next commission puts together. And I think once we see that, we're going to see whether or not this really is a significant policy shift rightwards. My expectation is that it is, and I would caution Greens and Social Democrats in Brussels to be whether they want to be attached to where this now, where the train is heading. All right. Thank you so much, Simon, for this interesting analysis of the election results. And we'll surely come back when we have our panel discussion, our third segment uh, later in this webinar. Simon, you provided a clear picture of the new European Parliament, the winners, the losers, shifts, and possible alliances. But now we also want to turn to you, the audience. And so we have a little poll set up 
for you as well. So if I can ask our technical support to bring up the poll, maybe. And the question that we're going to ask is, what will be the main political coalition in the European Parliament during this next term, 2024 to 2029? You've got four different options. The first one is the EPP, S&D, and Renew, so the super grand coalition that Simon mentioned earlier. Second option is the EPP, s and Renew, and the Greens. Third option is, instead of the Greens, it's going to go a bit more to the right, to the hard right, to the ECR, the European Conservatives and Reformers. And the fourth option that you can vote on is the EPP, the s and and Renew, the super grand coalition, them cherry-picking different national delegations, so flexible majorities, sometimes a little bit on the left, sometimes a little bit on the right, who can provide a majority. So I'll give you a couple more seconds to go through the poll and choose which one you believe would be the main political coalition in this next legislative term. All right, do we have some answers already? Okay, wow. Oh, this is very, very, I think a clear result. 50% said it's going to be the cherry picking. Flexible majority, sometimes a bit left, sometimes a bit right, with the super grand coalition of conservatives, social democrats, and liberals in the middle followed 18 percent it's just going to be the super grand coalition followed by the greens ifa option 17 percent and let's say the loser or the least likely option according to you our participants is the epp s d renew and ecr the heart right coalition interesting we'll be taking that and talk about that in our panel discussion later as well, because that will definitely have consequences for a lot of the policy files uh, that we discussed earlier. So moving to the second segment of our webinar, which are the country spotlights, because this election, yes, it's a European election, but I think this time around, it really affected some national capitals as well. I mean, look at France, Macron calling for snap parliamentary elections immediately after the result. Look at Belgium, Prime Minister De Croix resigning. So many EU national governments have been punished in the polls. And we as the Heinrich Böll Foundation have, of course, uh, many different offices in the world. It's around 36 offices worldwide. And of course, many offices also within the European Union and different EU member states. So it's my pleasure to have lots of my colleagues from these EU offices share their views on how the EU elections were seen in their different member states and the national context. We want to know from them who are the winners and the losers. How is the result affecting the national government and ruling coalition? And what were actually the main campaign issues and narratives that defined this election? And so I will invite each colleague one by one, Eurovision style, and to tell us more about these three issues. Every colleague has two minutes per country covered. And I think let's let's start moving a little bit more to the east, maybe with a where we had more positive news in the past, Poland. We have Joanna Maria Stolarek. She's the director of our Warsaw office uh, in Poland. Joanna, great to have you. Two minutes, the floor is yours. I tried. Hello from Warsaw. Five point go to Brussels. No, uh, <laughs> it would like be Eurovision style. So ten points. Uh, ten <laughs> points. Okay. Um, good news from Poland. Yes, but um, Sunday's European elections saw Prime Minister Donald Tusk centrist civic coalition party emerge victorious, taking thirty seven percent of the vote ahead of the National Conservative Law and Justice Party. Peace on 
36 percent it uh, was amazing because it was the first time in 10 years that peace has not finished top in a polish election what shows uh, on the one hand that the political climate in poland has changed but um, on the other hand, we have also a negative trend, and the negative trend means that the far-right Confederation Party is the biggest winner. On um, They are on the third place with 12%, having secured six seats this time after not receiving any in 2019 European elections. And 30% uh, of young voters between 18 and 29 years old vote for the this right-wing party. The biggest losers um, with 6% six, six and three mandates each other, um, each one are the coalition partners of uh, civic coalitions of the current government. This is the, the left party um, and the Christian center fat way party. And um, given the success uh, of right-wing and far-right parties in many parts of Europe, at this election, so some will be keen to present Tusk's victory as a rare success for the political center. Um, but that would be a little bit an exaggeration because the civic coalition's margin of victory against peace was less than a percentage point. Meanwhile, Confederation, as I said, surged in support and uh, third way collapsed and uh, the left stagnated. Um, the election results uh, highlight the substantial political divide in Poland with two main parties for, I guess, 30 years now. It's Donald Tusk Civic Coalition and Jarosław Kaczyński Law and Justice Party. Um, together, they received over 73% of the total vote. So the country is really divided. And political scientists have noted uh, how at times of international crisis, of geopolitical crisis, voters tend to rally around a leader such as the figurehead Donald Tusk that may uh, well have been a factor in helping civic coalition achieve its victory. The election results have strengthened the biggest party in the ruling um, coalition of the um, uh, government, the civic coalition, not only for beat peace for the first time in the nine uh, national elections, but also did so on its own without any coalition partners. This means this weakened further the standing of the two remaining parties within the alliance. Uh, they did not perform as well. We can say um, that Tusk swallowing uh, his coalition partners. Um, the lead up to the elections was dominated by security issues uh, relating to the threat Poland faces from the east. And during its campaign, um, the biggest party, Civic Coalition, focused on issues that um, are often the domain of the right, such as border security, military preparedness and opposing illegal migration. The voter turnout was around 40%, the lowest at any elections in Poland since 2014. Given how soon it came after local and parliamentary elections, it's likely that um, the voters were, are and were uh, fatigued. And there's um, another not so good news. Um, the Polish representation in the European Parliament will consist of only 14 women of 53 MEPs in total. In summary, um, there is a, a lot of light and hope in the East, but we need to be aware of the danger from the right. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Joanna. At least we started with a little bit of uh, light and not just uh, a lot of darkness. So moving on to Germany. In Berlin, our headquarters, we have Dietrich Hermann. Dietrich is the project officer for government, administration, and political parties at the Heinrich Böll Stiftung HQ in Berlin. Dietrich, the floor is all yours. Hello, this is Dietrich speak, speaking from Berlin. Uh, we've actually had the highest turnout in Germany with almost 65% except for Belgium, of course. Strong losses for the Greens with 8.6%, but with 
11.9% uh, in total, it's still higher than in 2014. Right-wing extremist AFD gains almost 5% to 15.9%. And uh, newly formed coalitions or Sarah Wagenknecht, uh, which is a populist anti-migration and Putin-friendly split up from the left, gets immediately 6.2%. There are also losses for the left and the SPD. And the, actually, the gains for the uh, CDU or CSU are minor, considering their, uh, the party's opposition role. A record of actually 15 German parties gained a seat in the EU parliament. Uh, the parties with less than 5% of the votes combined for more than 17% altogether. Now, the existing pressure uh, to improve, on, on, on now looking at the effects on the national government, the existing pressure to improve common performance in the coalition, in the national coalition, uh, will get stronger. But uh, this does not mean, of course, that the common performance will actually improve, I fear. From the right, there are calls for an immediate resignation of the Schultz government and for a general election. But in lack of a credible alternative, I see no real chance for change in government in uh, the national level. Uh, opposition leader Mats of the CDU is uh, even less popular than Scholz. Now, the main issues uh, in strong contrast to 2019, the climate protection was not the dominating issue anymore. We have had uh, peace and international security, social security and national level and migration to be considered the more important issue this year. Um, in several states in East Germany, AFD, the right extremist party is now the strongest party. This raises uh, questions regarding some regional elections in September. The Greens remain to be strong in big cities while dramatically underperforming in some rural areas. This is the first time in 2024 20, that 16 and 17 year olds could vote in EU elections. In contrast to 2019, when one third of the young voters under 25 voted green, this year only 11%. Now, almost one third of the young voters actually voted for small parties, thus contributing to the increasing fragmentation of the electorate. Uh, we've also had local elections um, in nine of 16 German states uh, on Sunday. Overall, as far as I can see, the losses of the Greens are not as heavy as in the European elections. The results are mostly considerably higher uh, than in 2014. Um, and we see in, the, in these local elections the triumph of a whole variety of local groups who are not at all connected or aligned with regional or national party. And this um, does not necessarily mean that these local parties are, or uh, local groups are uh, extremist, but this poses a problem for national parties. Their long established mechanisms of the formation of political will will be in jeopardy if they, if they fall out of track with local political levels. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dietrich, for this very comprehensive picture, also including uh, the, the local communal elections uh, level. Really useful. So moving on to another two big EU member states, especially France and Italy. Those are the two and all eyes on France right now, I would say, after Macron called his snap election. In Paris, we have Marc Berthold, the director of our Paris office, responsible for France and Italy. Marc, what's going on? <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> I'll come to that. Uh, bonjour uh, de Paris. Uh, thank you, Roderick. I'll start with Italy because it's in fact really a little bit less complex. And um, uh, the, the three questions that you uh, send us, it's um, I think the big winners, uh, there are there are, there's one big winner, which is Fratelli d'Italia and Giorgia Meloni, because uh, compared to the last European elections, she really, really increased uh, their seats. And it was also, she even increased compared to the last national elections when she came to power. Um, but also the uh, the Democratic Party, the Partito Democratico, uh, Elie Schlein's strategy has worked. And uh, sh she came in second and also increased compared to the last elections. And good news in Italy also from the Greens uh, with their left wing um, 
coalition alliance, um, they gained, um, as they returned to the European Parliament, one has to say. It's uh, between three and four seats, effectively. The losers is, the big loser is really Lega. They reduced from 33% to 9%. They lost 14 seats. And also the Five Star Movement, the Cinque Stelle, they, they lost uh, um, uh, compared to their last elections. Um, what it means for the national government, it is a big confirmation for Giorgia Meloni. She um, made this also uh, an election on her, um, the European debate and the campaign. And she was uh, confirmed and strengthened uh, with also within her coalition, based on the fact that Lega, one of her partners, really dropped that heavily. And um, the themes, one of our partners in Italy said uh, during the campaign, it's um, the climate debate is the new migration debate. The migration debate she actually tried to avoid and she wanted to prove that she delivered with this uh, deal that she got with Albania, even though it isn't in place, but it was her big thing. But um, there was a big backlash on the Green Deal and um, policies um, also during the Italian debate. And the opposition drove on the, the questions what Giorgia Meloni is doing in Italy with the rule of law and... Um, and also with media and um, and uh, social policies, anti-women and gender policies. Um, but all overall in Italy, before I come to France, is she claims, and it, we will see, and we'll have to see, as we heard before, what role she will now play on the European level. And this is her ambition to really be the speakers of the the pro-European but right um, groups uh, in the European Parliament. Coming to France, the big winner is, of course, uh, it's, uh, nobody. everybody knows this, it's the Rassemblement National um, with Jordan Badella. As confirmed, they drove in the, uh, the, their, um, their polls. And also the socialists, Raphael Glucksmann, he revived on the European level the Socialist Party in France. And um, the big losers are President Macron's Renaissance and unfortunately also the Green Party. They barely made it back into the uh, into the European Parliament. They have five seats. So, but this was a disappointing result for them. And um, how it affects um, the national government and political debate? Well, um, it was. Uh, mentioned uh, the snap elections and the dissolution of the National Assembly. And since Sunday evening, nine o'clock, uh, France is in a political turmoil. It's really chaotic. Um, there have been spontaneous demonstrations. There are big calls for demonstrations uh, for this weekend. And um, so it's not clear if President Macron actually is has control over this time for the three weeks over until the first round of the parliamentary elections. The, the left bloc was revived. They um, instantly, uh, on Monday evening, they formed a new popular front, how they call it this time. It was noobs before. And um, today they decided on which districts they will um, actually divide amongst themselves, not to compete against each other. Um, the Republican Party, those who often held, Les Républicains, who often helped Macron in the National Assembly to gain a majority, they are complete, they're about to implode possibly because their president, Eric Ciotti, they called single-handedly for a coalition with the a group or union with the Rassemblement National. And, but there is a huge opposition in the, uh, in the Republican Party in France. And um, Renaissance was completely caught off guard. Uh, Macron's party, uh, Ensemble, uh, only a close circle of it uh, his know, knew about it. And now we're there in this situation where even members of his party don't want to campaign with Macron. Um, because they feel like he's damaging their slight chances. And the first polls show a big win for the Rassemblement National. And um, the left bloc, the Popular Front, could come in second. And um, the Rassemblement, oh, no, sorry, um, Renaissance might come in third. But it's really, really not clear. Over the election campaign, I'm coming to the subjects. It was uh, from the right wing coming and the dominance was a migration debate, an anti-migration debate. There was also a backlash against the Green Deal policies, uh, the, the, the cars issue. We saw it also during the farmers protests, which were in France, really European oriented. And um, Macron set the tone of, you know, you remember like Europe can die. 
to say like also looking at the security risk for France and the role of France in securing um, Europe's democracy and future. But he didn't succeed with this. So um, this is a, a rather somber assessment of the situation in France, which is uh, really concerning. Thank, Thank you. you, Mark. So definitely a space to watch. And also, again, interesting about conservatives teaming up suddenly with the far and the hard right. Uh, one of the things, obviously, that we're watching in the European Parliament as well. So let's jump from France and Italy to Greece, calling Thessaloniki. Michalis Gudis, our director of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung and Thessaloniki. Michalis, the floor is yours. What's going on in Greece? Thank you, Rodri. Good afternoon from Greece, from Thessaloniki, Kalispera. Uh, beyond winners and losers, I think definitely the most disappointing uh, takeaway from the European elections in Greece is the level of participation. Uh, the voter turnout was just above 41%, which is unprecedentedly low in Greece. Almost 2 million fewer people went to vote uh, compared to the ones who did in the national elections in May and June last year in 2023. Um, the government of the Conservative Party, Nea Demokratia, which is led by the Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis, is without doubt among the losers of this election. They did not reach the target they set on their own, which was 33%. They only managed to get 28.3%. I think this is indicative that Nea Demokratia lost about 750,000 voters compared to the previous European elections, which is massive. But the result wasn't much better for the major opposition parties either. For example, Syriza experienced a further decrease of its electoral power. They gained just 49, 14 uh, 14.9%, uh, well below their own 20% target. They also lost 750,000 voters compared to the previous European elections. And PASOK, the socialists, remained rather stable in terms of percentage, but did not make it to their own goal, which was the second place, so that they would, became, they would become a significant player. On the winner side, unfortunately, one fund is the far right. Three parties managed to elect four MEPs, uh, gaining altogether a total of 16.6% of the votes. This is well above the historic high in the far right in the national elections just a year ago. And it's clear, uh, it's a clear sign, I would say, of the normalization of a new wave of far right in, in Greece. In terms of effect on the national government, um, already from the first moment that the official results were announced on Sunday, uh, a debate was triggered around the potential uh, cabinet reshuffle. Uh, the prime minister said in a TV interview last night that this shall not take place this week, so most probably is expected over the course of next week. But all in all, it is evident that the government did not meet citizens' expectations. The citizens gave uh, Nea Demokratia two landslide wins last year in the national elections, and they did not manage to deal with the exploding living costs. Uh, Greece is, for instance, by far the EU member state with the highest housing cost overburden rate, and it's also among the most expensive countries when it comes to energy prices still. But for me, the most important question is whether this result, with now three parties uh, adding pressure to the government from its own right, will lead Mitsotakis to a shift of the government narrative further to the right. Ne Democrati is, as you know, a conservative member party of the APP. It has a tough stance on migration, its own issues with the rule of law in Greece, but at the same time, it's the party that managed to adopt uh, laws like the law on same-sex marriage, to deepen the digitalization of the Greek state, and to even implement this time postal voting. This kind of balancing act, the balancing strategy between the right and the center seemed to be working uh, for Mitsotakis so far, so it remains to be seen what happens next and if this, this strategy will change. And closing with the issues of the campaign, I think it has been overall very disappointing, very self-referential, and inter alia very male-dominated pre-election period, as also a study of the National Center for Social Research illustrates. This was definitely a significant factor. There has been very limited connection between the national public debate and big issues at EU level. So nobody spoke in Greece about defense or the future of the common agricultural policy, the reform and enlargement of the EU, etc. Uh, so the parties were not very successful in explaining, I would say, the importance of the European elections and in mobilizing voters as the turnout rate shows. Uh, and this is also why the election outcome was defined on the one hand by the living cost issue, as I said, which is still huge in Greece, given also that the country is practically in a never ending economic crisis. And on the other hand, and this is my final point, I think this is indicative of an increasing trend, uh, trend that we observe in Greece, namely that of citizens turning more and more their back to the mainstream political system.
Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michalis. All the best to Greece and Thessaloniki. Moving back to one of the regions where we started, Central and Eastern Europe, the last country spotlight that we have, looking at Hungary and the Czech Republic. We had initially asked our colleague from the Prague office, but unfortunately, on short notice, she fell sick. And so we're very happy to have Nora Kövesh with us, who is the East Network Officer at the Greens EFA group in the European Parliament. And Nora is not just Greens EFA. Nora is actually a former colleague at the Heinrich Böll Stiftung Prague office, where she was in charge of the Hungary program. Nora, thank you so much for joining us at such short notice and uh, giving us a little bit of insights on Hungary and the Czech Republic. Thank you so much for the invitation and hello everyone. And uh, yes, indeed, I will start with Hungary. And um, I think that one of the most important takeaway from these elections there is that the status the status quo is broken basically after 14 years of Fidesz because what happened is that Fidesz still won the elections of course uh, with 1.9 uh, million votes which is actually much more what they received in the previous elections however in the mandate due to the high turnout they received actually less than before they now have 11 seats so this is a bit of a political defeat for them. And the reason for that is actually a new movement or a new party called Tisa Party, which is a very new movement established only and appeared only three months ago. It's the movement of Peter Magyar, who is basically the ex-husband of the former justice minister, Judith Varga. So he belonged to the inner circles of Fidesz. And uh, all these uh, political um, turnouts, what it caused was really interesting. And I will go a little bit one step back actually for you to understand a little bit the dynamics what has happened because so after Fidesz won the elections four times in a row with two thirds, basically the united opposition trying everything mathematically possible, uh, people in Hungary fell into a really big apathy. And even according to the statistics, we know that most of the people thought that this system, this urban regime can be only overthrown by someone from the inside. So when uh, this guy, Peter Magyar, appeared from the inner circles of Fidesz and started to leak very sensitive information of the government, which proved to be somehow true, then uh, he gained a support very, very fast. He's also quite a charismatic figure, a good speaker, etc. And it was a really uh, interesting process how uh, he basically swiped off all the opposition parties very fast who were already not in a very good shape. And another factor contributed to this was actually the 14 years of massive governmental propaganda and due to this, um, basically, the entire public discourse shifted so much to the right already that it was somehow also acceptable for the progressive voters to actually vote for a more conservative guy. Because he is still, I mean, even though during the campaign, he tried to appear as a progressive one, and he is, of course, much more progressive than Fidesz, but he is still coming from Fidesz, you know, so... So after basically 14 years of the Fidesz regime, we got to a point where the opposition of Fidesz is somewhat also Fidesz, but of course, just a more, <laughs> a more moderated version of it, uh, thankfully. Uh, so it was really interesting. We know it from the data that, uh, that he at the end got seven seats at the EP elections, which is really quite a lot and uh, 1.3 million votes. So he became a serious competitor of Fidesz, and we know it from the statistics that approximately 60% of his voters are coming uh, from the opposition. So these people voted for the joint opposition parties before, and only 10% of his voters are coming from Fidesz previously. So this is a really, really interesting shift. And we are really wondering where we are this led to, because Orban and the whole regime is obviously afraid of him. It was very visible during the campaign as well, that uh, also the propaganda, which was already quite 
quite intense. It got even worse. And their main message was to stop war, which is not our interpretation of war, needless to say. It, uh, you know, they wanted the Putin type of peace. What we know, what does it mean? Uh, and uh, in his last speech, Orban literally said that people should either vote for him or they are going to die. So they went really uh, to a very far extent and it still uh, and it still didn't really work for them as much as they hoped. And uh, yeah, we are of course going to see what is happening, what will happen because uh, his party is still very much of a one-man show. Uh, we don't know who these seven MEPs are really because they were not in politics before. We we don't know what to, what to expect from them. We know that this party is going to sit in EPP. Uh, Peter Mayer also declared it several times that he wants all the rule of law procedures, all the conditionality procedures to be closed against Hungary so the money can flow. Ah. So yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be very interesting. It's, and then so I will go to is it, does it look yes. any better in the Czech Republic then? <laughs> Uh, well, in the Czech Republic, it's also uh, quite interesting because there are some similarities there. So also the government party there um, suffered a bit of a political defeat. So Spolu got six mandates and Stan two and the Pirates one uh, separately in this way. But Anu, uh, the party of Babish, got seven mandates and there were many protest votes. Uh, also, which went to basically the the bit of the the further right and bit to the uh, the further left. There is this Prishaha and motorist coalition, uh, where the leading candidate of Prishaha uh, turned out to be uh, basically a sympathizer of Nazi Nazi ideologies, and they still got uh, two mandates. And there is this coalition called Statilo, which is uh, much more on the left side. Uh, which got also um, two MEPs. Uh, so yes, it's also what I think is very an, an interesting takeaway from both countries as well, that there were many protest votes. People voted uh, in many cases for the anti-establishment party. And unfortunately in most country or in both countries, um, the right and the far right got really strong, strong. So in Hungary, basically, we have only two progressive MEPs from the entire Hungary in the European Parliament now and from the Czech Republic. Wow. I only counted five. Uh, and all the other parties and mandates are went for the right, the far right and the fascist. So this is um, yeah, obviously okay. not so good. Well. Thank you so much for your insights. And again, thank, thank you. you for joining us at short notice. Thank you so uh, much the for best. the invitation. <laughs> Take thank care. You. Well, and thank you, of course, to all of my uh, colleagues who were here and shared their analyses and insights and expertise. And I think we've had a great overview of the European Parliament elections in seven different EU member states. So now we are approaching our third and final segment, our panel debate uh, together with Amida van Rij, uh, Mar Garcia Sanz, and of course, Simon Hicks. But before we do, one more chance. We want to gauge the temperature and ask you, our audience, uh, with another poll. And you might think, well, this poll, the answer is clear, but you never know. So we're going to ask you, uh, if I can get the poll up, please, ask the technical support. Ursula von der Leyen. Do you think she's going to get enough support from the European Parliament and the European Council to be a re-elected president of the European Commission? So you got, again, four options here. You got a yes, you got a no, you got a maybe, and you got a, I, I don't know. Simon already alluded to which way he's thinking. Don't let that influence you. This is your call. What do you think? waiting a couple more seconds for you to make up your mind and decide. All right, and if we have some results already, and I can share those with you as well. Ah, clear, yes, according to the poll, 65% believe she's gonna get it, 8% believe She's not going to get it. So who knows? Maybe those are the 8% that are going to be right in the end. 
And 20%, I think that's pretty sizable, actually. 20% to fifth, you know, maybe. That's not clear. And if I take that with the nose, it's 28. If I take the I don't know, which is 6%, then you suddenly get over 30 something. So not that safe, uh, I would argue, for Ursula von der Leyen's uh, re-election. All right, so we're entering the last segment of our webinar. We're running a little bit behind, but we'll manage, no worries. We've learned a lot about the electoral behaviors, the results, the shifts, the coalitions, but now we actually want to discuss what does that mean? And we already have a lot of questions uh, in our chat. Thank you for that as well. So let me ask our panelists to join me on the stage. We have Amida van Rij. She's a senior research fellow and head of Europe program at the think tank Chatham House in London. And her main research focus is the future of the EU, European security policy, and Europe's role in the world. We also have Mar Garcia Sanz. Mar is a board member of the Green European Foundation, a European level political foundation of which we are members. Mar is based in Barcelona, and she was actually the secretary general of the European Green Party from 2014 to 2022. So she also saw this massive electoral victory for the Greens in 2019. And currently she's the director of the European Center for Digital Action. Welcome, uh, welcome Amida. And of course we have Professor Simon Hicks. Thank you so much again, Simon, for having uh, shared your analysis and joining us again for this panel. So I wanna kick off with you, Amida, because the EU is crunched between the US and China there's a war on our doorstep. Russia's threat is really very real. Von der Leyen has advocated for a geopolitical commission. And not everybody has been happy about this geopolitical commission, I would say. Not every national capital. And so against this background and this new constellation in the European Parliament and Council, I think you have a Dutch background. So, I mean, we have a new Dutch government as well with the far right. What does all this mean for the future of EU foreign and security policy? And maybe a bit provocatively, are the real winners of this elections Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping? So just passing the floor over to you. Thanks very much, Roderick. Um, and thanks very much to Heinrich Bull for um, for organizing this great webinar. It's been, it's been really good to hear the different country perspectives, um, as well as Simon's presentation at the start. Um, so, yes, where to start? So, uh, yeah, um, I was asked to, to talk a little bit about the, the kind of the short term future of um, the EU's foreign policy and um, some quite provocative questions there, there, Roderick. I think to give you the bottom line up front, um, in the short term, I think it's unlikely that the EU's foreign policy will shift dramatically um, in light of the results. But the long term may be different, of course. I think the reality is that the biggest shift in foreign policy priorities happened after Russia's full scale invasion in 2022. And so we're very much if von der Leyen is going to be reelected, um, which uh, the majority of participants here seem to think that she will be, then she'll very much kind of stay the course and will have a continue continuity on that front. She's made it very clear that for this second term as commission president, defense and security would be priorities as well as enlargement. So that's that's very, very clear. Um, what I do think we need to kind of highlight and bear in mind as we talk about the EU's foreign policy is that there remain very different risk and threat perceptions across the different member states. So Estonia feels very differently than Spain does. And it would be quite interesting to see if, for example, Kaya Kalas um, does get the, um, the high representative um, role, because that would be evidence of the shift of focus actually shifting to the east um because so far i know that some in the baltics and some of the eastern european countries feel that that actually hasn't materialized as much but what i think is important to think about more carefully is beyond the parliamentary elections is really what simon was was talking about earlier and alluding to earlier is the dynamics between the council the european council and the council of ministers and the European Parliament, because I think that's where there's potentially reason for a little bit more concern if we look at these kind of dual forces um, at play at the same time. And I do want to pause just a second on this um, support for the far right uh, that we've seen. It's it's failed to materialize, as Simon explained very well. 
to the extent that we expect it, but that doesn't mean that uh, they haven't done very well, particularly in key European countries who are key players when it comes to foreign policy. So France, Germany, Italy, either far-right governments are already in place in Italy, or they may be in place certainly um, uh, in France quite soon, but also looking at the at the looking ahead at the German Bundestag elections next year, um, you know, AfD is polling second, quite well below CDU and CSU, but still they are polling second. So I think that's something we that is a cause for concern, particularly as um, uh, 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 heads of government who sit in the council become more concerned or perhaps more tuned towards these trends in their own member states. On the far right is not a, a kind of a, a homogenous group, and they're particularly divided on providing support to Ukraine. But broadly, I think it's worth saying that they do not see benefits of further security and defense integration at the EU level. Um, and again, that, that might have an impact. Um, although they may well be in favor of further EU funds for defense industries, particularly those countries who have big defense industries. I won't talk in more detail about France because we had a very good overview earlier, um, but I think the the bit that I do want to highlight is as we have these kind of quite big national contingents, they may well have an impact on um, when it comes to uh, the allocation of funds for foreign policy initiatives that have to pass through the parliament, and they may well have um, uh, some influence on the budget negotiations as well. So essentially, in short, um, I think limited short-term impact, potentially quite concerning longer-term trends and impact. I think there are three things to keep an eye out and to watch. Um, the first is defense. We've, you know, von der Leyen announced at the Munich Security Conference that she wants to uh, create a defense commissioner post. There's a fair amount of momentum around this at the moment, particularly with the defense industrial strategy. I tend to compare this back to 2016 when um, we had the strategic concept and the compass. Um, I feel like at the moment we do need to see whether there's actually going to be meat on the bones put put to these initiatives. Otherwise, it is just going to be fluff and air. Um, so if there is going to be a defense commissioner, what exactly will their portfolio entail? What will the budget allocation be? Where is that portfolio allocation coming from is also quite interesting. Um, how much focus might there be, for example, on economic security issues, particularly in reference to your question to China earlier? Um, and I think there will be really interesting to look at the extent to which the, the focus will be on defense industry, which I think is quite likely, and also um, the commission's ability to connect this to the competitiveness agenda and economic growth agenda as well. The second area to watch, um, and I know that Simon will speak about this in, in more detail in a minute, but I do just want to highlight how enlargement has become this key foreign policy tool for the EU in recent decades. And I think we have to be really careful and we cannot let this be hijacked by populist and Eurosceptic forces in the way that, you know, happened with the migration debate, really. And so that requires a really honest conversation with EU citizens about both the benefits of enlargement, but also the risks and how we might mitigate some of the risks of enlargement, particularly when it comes to discussions around um, reallocation of cohesion funds or agri agricultural funds, which will, will have an impact. Um, that's inevitable. And then the third thing to look out for is um, looking to our friends across um, the trans across the Atlantic, the US election. Um, and of course, we can't have any debate about this at the moment without mentioning the US election, unfortunately. But um, I think the risk for the EU and for the European Parliament in particular there is if there is a second Trump presidency, there may be some in the far right um, who have so far perhaps suppressed their more pro-Putin instincts, um, Maloney being one of them, but Wilders in the Netherlands being another one of them. And they may begin to um, start shifting their approach if they feel emboldened by Trump. And that would have massive implications on Ukraine, um, which I'll, I'll come to now. Um, broadly on Ukraine, um, yes, there has been an increase in Putin supporting MEPs, um, the Rassemblement National, the AfD, the FBO in Austria. Um, but I think we just need to make that distinction between what kind of support are we talking about? Are we talking about um, uh, support for Ukraine to help win their war against, against Russia? Or are we talking about Ukraine accession? Because there's different dynamics there. 
it's very clear that in the European Parliament and also at the EU Council, bar Hungary, um, there's overwhelming support for Ukraine's wars, war of resistance against Russia, whether we look at sanctions, whether we look at military, financial or humanitarian aid. Um, and there's also very high levels of public support for this, according to the latest um, Euro, uh, barometer. By and large, at the moment, there's still also a lot of support for more contentious issues like trade liberalization. Um, but this may begin to shift in particular as um, far right and perhaps even center right parties may begin to feel that um, they may not support market access um, if they feel that that may upset their voter base, in particular if we're talking about farmers. And so in my mind, when it comes to foreign policy issues, really the biggest um, issue at the moment is, or in the short to medium term, is to really think about how to deal with obstructive member states in the EU Council because that's where we might see um, uh, a bigger impact and a bigger increase of support. We, we know about Orban, we've, we've, we've seen that, um, those consequences. There's of course also FITSO. Um, we will see the extent to which the Dutch may begin to shift on this. So I think it's worth keeping an eye on what happens at the EU Council level. Um, perhaps the one silver lining out of all of this, and I'll leave it there, is as we heard from your from your colleague um, in, in Hungary, um, Orban has been slightly weakened after these parliamentary elections. And I think that's the one silver lining for now. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Amida. Lots, lots to take away, definitely. Also, the enlargement point, which I will also post to Simon later, uh, because that's in our questions uh, box, arrived in our question box as well. Uh, let me get Ma on the stage. Because we want to start looking a little bit also into the green transformation uh, issues. Ma, Simon already alluded to this is not good news for the Green Deal. How, how do you, you look uh, on the green transformation and what this new um, parliament and council and commission might bring? Um, thanks. Thanks, Roderick. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Hendrik Paul, for inviting me. I mean, it's always a pleasure to be here. So I just I'm going to concentrate my answer on 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 this green aspect. I just uh, want to uh, remind um, some of the things that have been said very quickly. But like, yes, I mean, uh, um, we are not coming from uh, from um, uh from from the air in that sense, I mean, we're coming from a very green uh, legislature. Uh, so um, we've uh, we've been coming after a green wave, and you know how this uh, um, last European Parliament and Commission adopted a green deal, which seemed a uh, uh, a dream. But uh, now with the 2024 results, the question is if you will be able to continue, you know, to set this liberal, progressive, green tone and agenda. I think that the answer um, um, is probably. Probably, uh, well, no, but uh, it's not a clear no. I think that it also has nuances. I think that um, now, as it had been said, everything will depend much more on the conservatives of the EPP. And this is also something that we progressive Greens and the rest of progressives should ensure that it depends on the EPP and not on the far right. And why am I saying this? I think that... Um, this is not the, situa the situation that we would prefer, but I believe is the one that we should aim for, because the situation in which we're facing now, the results of the, uh, the extreme right uh, that have been uh, you know, presented by Simon along and the many countries, um, this reflects the influence and the overall uh, and power that the far right has been in actually, you know, putting forward their agenda and uh, their the framing the narrative. Yeah, when on the one hand they have gained strength and more representation, but on the other hand, and that is for me the most challenging fact, they've managed to impose their values, their political ideology, and their societal views and their anti-green agenda. And the conservatives have somehow fallen into that trend. So the extreme right will, of course, continue to try to influence and impose their economic views, their anti-green and their understanding of freedom and civil rights and their foreign and migration policies, as well as the their geopolitical priorities that were just presented. Yeah. So um, in this extremely volatile time with the prospects of a hypothetical return of Trump in the one house, I think that Greens and progressives in general should do everything possible not to leave you in the hands of the far right. And uh, so um, 
I think that, uh, you know, the uh, green agenda should be reassessed according to the strengths and uh, we should come up with new strategies resulting from uh, reframing what is possible to be done according to uh, the priorities that we have, but uh, also ensuring there is a proper implementation, you know, taking into account what is possible. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm just trying to say this because this is not about the politics that we want, but the politics that can be done, yeah? And uh, some of us are in politics always to try to improve people's life, and we cannot forget this. So um, it's better to do little than nothing. So in the case of uh, the uh, European Green Deal that the EU has been discussing, I mean, as I was saying at the beginning, is the result of a certain correlation of forces, yeah? Certainly, um, it was not in the agenda of the far right, who would simply love to erase it. So if the parties with green ambitions and the citizens with environmental concerns want the Green Deal to continue, progressives in general and Greens in particular should manage to create the conditions so that... Um, what we have been approved, it's now irreversible. So we, this, this means implementing a strategy that should be rooted in three main objectives. The first one is to take advantage of the knowledge and credibility of the academic and scientific world in alerting about the negative effects of the climate crisis. So uh, we need to use the uh, science as a loudspeaker of uh, the uh, challenges of the uh, climate crisis. So not only to combine climate denialism, but also to combat the sweetening of the problem. Um, the goal would be to maintain the necessary social tension on alarm about that challenge. I know that this is not easy, but I think that this is a goal that uh, the Greens should have in mind in order to keep the Green Agenda alive. Yeah, It's true that problems are accumulating and people's concerns are multiplying, but the climate crisis remains the greatest risk that humanity is facing. On the second, uh, the second item, I'd say um, uh, it's to adjust the rhythm uh, to what is really digestible for all the political protagonists. And again, this is not the uh, situation that I would like, but now being aware that the conservatives are going to be the kingmakers, uh, for sure, uh, we will have to swallow some of their priorities. And again, this is not the desired situation, but this is how we manage the reality. Yeah? And in the binomial economy climate, we will for sure lose speed and capacity, and we need to accept this. The thing is, what are we going to prioritize and what are we going to put forward or to try to find the alliances to put forward? Um, and I think that uh, in order to get this, this is why this third element is probably the most important. And this one is to try to match the benefits of the green transition to the interest of the most affected sectors. Yeah, It's clear that the carbonizing the economy, the change of a production model will affect sectors, territories, and interests. Also fighting climate uh, change jeopardizes the interests, uh, the livelihoods, and the way of life of certain people. You don't have to be a prophet. In fact, the result of these elections are probably, you know, part of this. But that this, the sectors that are like not being protected in this climate transition or in this, you know, effect of the climate, uh, the climate challenge, um, those that don't feel their interest are taking care, and uh, um, they they have been, you know, adopting the narrative of the far right. Yeah. So the yellow vest was already a sign that we maybe didn't read uh, well. And the recent farmer protests are also being um, a sign of this, yeah? So in order to change a productive model, it's not enough to have the right model defined. We also need to convince and to finance. And somehow the Greens, we have not been able to convince and to finance, especially those Greens that have been in government along this journey, yeah? to convince entrepreneurs and carbonized industry that uh, they will be able to continue generating economic activity, generating employment, making profit by evolving their economic activities into decarbonized ones. For these progressives, we'll have to get out of their comfort zone and search for allies beyond the most related ones. And uh, most important, they need to provide security because these, I think, are the answers that the far right has been providing. That means guaranteeing that there will be reconversion plans for affected workers. So in short term, I think that we need to you know, guarantee a fair transition, but not only saying it, but trying to make it possible, whatever it is. Yeah? The EU and the member states have uh, had a lot of experience in facing industrial reconversion processes. We should aim to replicate those successful examples. 
So let's not forget successful experiences have always been the result of a triple alliance between administration, businesses, and workers. I would like to put on the table, how much do we talk to businesses? How much do we talk to workers? Yeah. One final note on the instrument to do all this, because it was also a question, what's the role of civil society? And let me tell you that in the era of the new technologies and after being, uh, you know, directing the European Center for Digital Action, I've been probably in touch with all progressive parties across Europe. We are work in the 27, 26 member states and political parties, trade unions that are the main instruments that we have to do politics have become less and less competitive to not only convince, but to ally with the people and to gain the support to their ideology, to their understanding, to their ideas and to their values. And it's because of their fear of connecting and inviting citizens to their political fight. Um, this would be a topic of a whole different webinar, but digital tools have brought endless potential of engagement with citizens. And the far right has very well understood that. Uh, and progressives are far from understanding this. I just want to say an, a small example for Spain, this new party, uh, which is called Se Acabó La Fiesta, the party is over, has managed to get three MEPs, mobilize uh, nearly one million people to vote for them. This is a party that has, you know, that has based all their campaign in digital tools and that they have been for like more than one and a half years engaging with citizens. I don't agree, of course, with any of their, um, um, you know, ideas, but I just think that I don't know any political progressive party across Europe that has uh, managed to implement and, and engage with, with, with citizens uh, to that stage. And I think that this is also something that uh, um, the, the, the instruments that we have to make politics like parties, trade unions and uh, and organized civil society will have to give a thought. So um, yeah, um, in conclusion, I don't want to underestimate the danger represented by the growth of national populism, but I also think that um, um, the shift to the right now in the uh, in the you know aftermath of the uh, short term would be like ooh, but uh, if we look into numbers, hasn't been that much. It's true that the center of the the gravity has changed, and now the EPP needs to be taken in consideration for everything. But I think that uh, I remain confident that the European Union will be able to overcome these moments and progressives and Greens will manage to overcome these difficulties times. I think that we we must do this. We owe it to, to our kids and to the next generations. Thank you, Ma. Thank you so much. We are running out of time and I'm aware of this. We're running a little bit behind. So I would actually ask maybe all panelists to join me back on stage. Uh, Ma, I would ask you just, I'm going to pose you this question now. You can think about it. You said we need to swallow some of the conservatives pills. Now, one of that pill is getting rid of um, the ban on internal combustion engine. Is that one of the pills that we should be swallowing? Uh, just a question for later. I want to move to you, uh, Simon, and I want to pick up some of the questions that we already had on the chat. So one was... Uh, very interesting. If von der Leyen is not re-elected, what potential scenarios do you see happening? What, what, where, which way could things go? And the other question was, if you could go a little bit more into the enlargement and how you see the European Parliament um, and the Commission and the Council, what dynamic with this new constitution uh, constituted um, place we could have for for enlargement, Simon? Yeah, um, I think you know the, the von der Leyen issue. Uh, if she's if if she's not appointed, I imagine they'll go for somebody further right. I don't necessarily think they'd go for Draghi. There's been some discussion about Mitsotakis, but I doubt that very much. I'm not sure there's somebody waiting in the wings uh, to be appointed as an alternative. Um, and I think they will try and put a whole package deal together across a range of posts to persuade the socialists to back her. That's, the, I think, the best case scenario from the government's and the parliament's point of view. Um, in terms of the institutional dynamics as we move towards the issues of enlargement, I think initially we're going to see quite a, a common political majority across the three EU institutions. It's going to be a centre-right to populist right majority, a liberals through to the populist right majority across all three institutions. And, and that will allow them to try and set a policy agenda 
in the direction against some of the things we've been hearing and some of the things that I know your group and your political family are in favor of. Um, but on enlargement, I think this is very difficult. I, I cannot see the jigsaw puzzles in place to push enlargement very quickly through the governments or through the parliament. Uh, the parliament might be more in favor of this than I think uh, the governments. It has to be unanimous agreement. And I don't see that being very easy uh, to put together, particularly given what might happen in France. I think a lot of us, as you say, are watching Paris, are watching what's going to happen in France. And I think that will have a significant impact on the agenda of the EU towards a whole range of issues, including enlargement. One of the questions that just came in on the chat was, uh, how come the Greens lost so many seats? I mean, Ma explained a bit for it. What, what do you think, uh, Simon and uh, Amida, yeah. starting with you, Simon? I think the Greens did very well in several key larger member states last time round. So particularly Germany and France. And so so and, and I think that was a mobilization of younger voters around Fridays for Future, a mobilization of environmental issues. Uh, and I think all across Europe, in a sense, we we had that green wave and the green wave has gradually subsided. And I think it is exactly the type of things that Ma uh, and Amida were alluding to in that. I think the next, the challenge, the new challenge for the Greens or progressives who want a more ambitious climate policy are the distributional questions. Who's going to pay for this? How are these costs going to be? You know, how are it, it feels very much like uh, lower income groups, lower income families, small businesses, farmers, uh, you know, the costs are being imposed by a kind of cosmopolitan elite. We would like an ambitious climate agenda and you guys are going to have to pay for this. You're going to have to replace your cars and replace your boilers and change the way you do farming. And and of course, the populist right are able to mobilize and say, look, these guys are dictating to us. They're telling us what we should be doing, how we should be thinking, and they're also imposing costs. So so, so I think the next the next challenge is going to be to think about how to have a sort of just transition and how to how to fund that just transition. So the costs are really shared across society and not borne by uh, lower income groups and smaller businesses. I want to pass on to Amida, and I, I wanted to add one more question as well, because you mentioned very well that in terms of defense and foreign security policy, the EU needs to put some meat on the bone. Mm. And that means putting money where its mouth is. But if you look at the Dutch coalition agreement, I think they want to cut their contribution to the EU by 15% or something like this. So how do you see this new parliament and this whole question of, you know, show me the money? Yeah. Really good issue. Um, just a very quick comment on the on the green um, transition, if I may. I think uh, I think it's worth bearing in mind that the swing to the greens last time in 2019 was very big. So you know they they kind of had a lot more to lose this time round. Um, and I think to some extent, perhaps the more interesting question is why did the liberals lose so much? Why did Renew lose so much? Um, on the Dutch question and on defence spending, I mean, the the Dutch coalition agreement and the grouping of um, or the, the coalition that has been formed is very much further evidence of this kind of Eurosceptic, somewhat populist um, trend that we're seeing across Europe, really. Um, there, I mean, particularly those three parties, the NSC, the BBB and the PVV, the Freedom Party, their priority is absolutely to hollow out the EU from within and they do not want to see anything further going to the EU institutions to deepen integration, et cetera. Um, so there's this clear gap between what is needed and what will happen when it comes to um, Dutch politics. The other thing worth noting is that um, three of these parties in the coalition are parties without recent governing experience. The, the 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 Conservative Party has obviously recent governing experience. It's been very interesting to watch how they've campaigned um, for the European Parliament elections on a very pro-EU platform. But the Freedom Party hasn't governed since 2012 when it was because of them that the government fell. The BBB is a new party and the NSC is a new party, i.e. they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and so they think they could come to Brussels with all of these demands, which just is not going to work. Um, the other thing, just very quickly, is... If we look at the different manifestos, it is more heavily focused on, or it's more concentrated on defense and security within the Netherlands to secure our own borders. And that's also very much how the Freedom Party has presented it, as opposed to support for Ukraine. 
So again, there, there's that nuance, um, which might seem like a small nuance, but actually will have quite a big impact if that's something that they will pursue. I think they will be reined in um, quite a bit by uh, the Conservative Party on that front. And it's also the Conservative Party I've just seen who were allocated the Defence Ministry. So that's kind of some room um, for hope. But yes, it's not a positive um, trend in the Netherlands. Thank you, Amida. Ma, which pills do we have to swallow? Let me just comment on the green result. I just want to say that um, the green result is hasn't been a disaster. The, the greens have actually strengthened the representation in many countries where we were not before. So we do have two big holes, which is Germany and France, that have did not go, you know, as they went on the 2019. Amida was just saying it. They had such a big gain that now they had you know a lot to lose. So, but the Greens won in Denmark. They've been. They now have an MEP from Romania. They probably will have MEPs from Italy, like we have from Latvia. I mean, we didn't do that bad. We just you know our main. Um, well, I mean, you know, it could have been a disaster, like like uh, we wouldn't have been like in other elections, we didn't have any representation in the South and in the East, and this is not the case. But yeah, it's bad in France and bad in Germany in the sense of, you know, what we we had compared to 2019. So I just want to, that in the long term, we're establishing ourselves and consolidating in some countries where we were not before. And uh, that's a big advancement. Then um, what pills we have to swallow? I mean, we will have to decide as, you know, as the legislature moves and what's on the table. But what I'm really, really sure is that we need to connect and represent, you know, this the voice of this fair transition. So we need to be able to connect and to be the voice of those that feel that we are imposing this agenda and that we are jeopardizing the way of life. And we haven't been able to do that. We failed. And that's also the reason why, you know, in those countries where the Greens have been in government, maybe they haven't, you know, got the gains that we could have. We should have, um, you know, for many reasons, but we should have somehow, uh, you know, been more sensitive on representing the sectors of those that the climate is going to affect. And uh, very good point. I just have to stop you there briefly, Ma, because Simon actually has his next meeting running up. So I just wanted to say thank you so much, Simon. We won't keep you any longer. Uh, have a good one. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Bye. Ma, there was also one question in the chat on disinformation and to yes. what extent disinformation played a role in the election. Maybe we can just briefly. Uh, go into that and then we'll close the webinar. Yeah, I mean, very quickly, but uh, as I said, I mean, the the, the new technology, the digi digital world has had a huge impact that we're probably not aware. Uh, certainly progressive parties in general are not aware. And uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, threats uh, uh, online, uh, the, the online threats and the disinformation campaigns have played a major role. And uh, progressives are not set and ready to counter those threats because we're lacking trainings, we're lacking understanding, we're lacking professionalization of, you know, how to face these threats. And uh, the far right has been for the, let's say, the last 10 years, trained on how to master and optimize the potential of the digital tools in mm. order to you know, put their message forward. Yeah. And really the result of these elections really shows all these, you know, there is no uh, like a big theory that explain, you know, why are they gaining? Well, it's accumulation of many of these things where also the digital tools play a big role. So this information is a threat that we're facing and we're not well set to face it, yeah? And the result in many countries, um, it also responds and how the far right has understood the digital tools, have been using them to put their message further and how progressives are lagging behind in this. Again, um, the the uh, the, uh, the Spanish case is so telling, but I mean, we could uh, go through all the online threats that the many member states have been put forward. Mm -hmm. They come from the coordinated bad actors and they use the same playbook. So we just need to speed up on understanding and facing this. And get better ourselves. Yeah. All right. Well, we've come to the end of our webinar. Thank you so much, Ma. Thank you so much, Amida van Rij, for joining us and sharing your expertise, insights and analysis. It's been a real pleasure. And let me close by saying that we've been following the run-up of the European Parliament elections since the beginning of this year through a dedicated web dossier featuring insights from the Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung's offices, 
project partners and uh, on the European elections, the next EU legislative term, and of course the super election year 2024. For example, we just recently published an article on the election in India. And so our coverage does not stop with this European Parliament election. On the contrary, we're going to follow the constitution of the new parliament, the vote for the commission president, the hearings for new commissioners, the next work program of the European Commission. There is a lot of stuff happening right now in Brussels. So please check out our web dossier, sign up to our mailing list so you don't miss any of the updates and event invitations. You will can see the link uh, in the chat, which has been shared with you. Check out also the latest edition of our flagship magazine, the Böll Thema. This edition is dedicated to Europe and to the European uh, Parliament elections and also to the issue of enlargement, because it was 20 years ago that we had the Big Bang enlargement as well. That link we will also share with you in the chat. And last but not least, of course, we would really appreciate your feedback on this webinar. So we can also learn what we can do better, what we can improve. So you will be directed when you leave this webinar to a survey, and we kindly ask you to complete that survey as well. So we can make sure that we take your suggestions and uh, improvements on board for the next time. I'd like to thank all my colleagues and all the Bell offices in Europe. I'd like to thank all the colleagues here in the Brussels office who have been involved in the preparation of this webinar. Anna Cinska, Joan Lanfranco, Zora Siebert, Helena Borst, and many others. Thank you so much for all your support. Thank you for the technical staff. And thank you, of course, to you, your audience, who joined us uh, for this webinar and also with your results in the polls. Until next time, I wish you all the best. Goodbye.